Welcome back to the podcast, guys. We're on number eight. I have... We are empty. on number nine. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're on number nine. Yeah, we're, we're cruising nine. along. I got yes, a plate sir. of empty brownies and uh, some iced tea, guys, and we're ready to talk. He's high as a kite. Yeah. What do you got going over there in uh, central PA? Oh, my gosh. We got snow and slush today, and tomorrow's Slowly. supposed to be 62. Tomorrow's supposed to be 70-some <sighs> degrees here tomorrow. PA weather is whack. Yeah. And then when I head to Virginia, um, it's for a client, it's supposed to be almost 80. Nice. Crazy, right? Yeah, it is. I might have to sit on the sit on the beach and tan my head up. Oh, boy. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah. Sit on the beach, tan my, tan my bald head up. Oh, my. <clears throat> so, today... Um, it's an, always an interesting topic because there's always, there's always a debate on it, whether people want to use it or not, but that's food plots created without chemicals. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I believe creating food plots with chemicals and without chemicals, both can be done. Um, it's really a personal preference. Um, personally, I, I mean, I don't like using them. I just don't want to mess with them, you know? Um, I, you always that, you know, you have, you're breathing the chemicals in, you're getting some on your skin sometimes, or, and it's just, I don't want to mess with them. Not only that, they're expensive. So we're going to yeah. talk about a little bit of strategies and stuff to, so people can kind of get away from that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Your preference is to not have to use them at all if you can get away with it. But, uh, if you can't, if you're in a real bad situation, you're going to have to spray yeah absolutely for sure for sure yeah and i don't i don't like the wind drift and that and mm -hmm. you know, look what happened to you last year your farmer came and sprayed and he got your got egyptian some of your wheat. egyptian wheat and killed it you know killed it me. happens it happens it does. yeah yeah so um i have i think we you were part of it too but we have several videos um on the channel about herbicide free food plots and I want to start out by saying, let's, let's give the people an example of say you have a brand new spot. You had never been a food plot. You're leading into the springtime. Things are starting to green up. What do you do if you're not going to use chemicals? If I was not to use chemicals, I would mow as low as I could get. Mm -hmm. And then I use cultivators and I, I tear down pretty deep and turn that soil all over because I don't use mold board plows or anything like that. That's what I do. I, I hit it with the cultivators, turn it over and I let it sit for about a week. And then I just repeat that process. Like, cause I work. So like Saturday, usually from Saturday, Saturday, I let it sit and the next Saturday. I'll, I'll roll it all over again. I roll it a couple of times with the cultivators and then I'll come back and disc mm -hmm. and the sun will bake the weeds that have been uprooted and kill them. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you have all the other people that are going to say that they're no-till and that I've killed all the biome and all the critters in the soil by doing that. You, you kill earthworms. Shame yeah, on you. I do. I do. Now, <clears throat> when you do that, what would you be planning? Are we, what are we, what are you talking? Spring or summer? Spring. You just diss the plot and what are you going to plant? I don't do much spring and summer stuff anymore, but uh, spring and summer is a good time to get uh, your clovers established, your buckwheats established, your oats established, that type of thing. Something that you would probably want to plow down for your fall plantings. Right. Yeah. Yep. I plan ahead. <laughs> Whatever I put in the spring is usually something to plow down for the fall right. and, you know, use it for the green manure factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, if I'm going into a new area, what I'm going to do is probably mow it down very low. And I'm going to diss that area maybe the weekend or something before I plan on planting. I'll disc it once. I'll let it sit. You're, you are going to get some regrowth. Sure. And then I'll come back in the, the following weekend or whatever it is a week later. And I'll disc it one more time, try to time it with rain. And something in that situation I like to plant something that's going to germinate very quickly, which is buckwheat. For because sure. Buckwheat's going to come up within a couple of days. It's going to be 
you know, whatever it is, a couple inches. Got to be quicker than the weeds. <laughs> yes. Yep. And buckwheat will do that. And yeah. then that's a way to do that. And then you are still going to get some weeds, but the buckwheat is going to outgrow those weeds. And eventually it should take over as long as you're getting rain and it's going to shade out the undergrowth of that. And then with that situation, you're leading into the spring and summer. So you are going to get some weed growth. But the buckwheat is primarily there to, like you said, dream manure to turn back into the soil to kind of prep yourself leading into the fall. And depending on what state you're in, what part of the country you're in, you can plant that buckwheat, wait five weeks or something, disc it back under and have a second planting of buckwheat before going into your um, fall planting. You know, I have never really got a good second planting of buckwheat in, in my region, though, mm -hmm. because where i'm at in central pa here that the soil temperature you know buckwheats and you're screening egyptian wheats and things like that they like that heat um and my soil temperature things are germinating you know out there 50 degrees or so man i i get in weather like i am today you know it's snowing today and gonna be beautiful tomorrow I never know when that next frost is coming. So yeah, you live in a weird, uh, weird part it's, of the it, area. It is. It's weird, man. I mean, I've I've actually been turkey hunting in the snow before mm -hmm. in the spring. You know, it, yep. it's just it's just you never know when you're gonna get it. Well, look what happened to us when we uh, had the skid steer at the farm. Right. It was it was maybe May twentieth, May twenty second or something, and we got caught in a snowstorm. Yeah. Yeah, the the weather's crazy here. I mean, yeah, that I'm, wasn't too far from you. I'm in like a snow belt right here, and coming off a of Lake Erie, it blows over, and I get nailed. Yeah, you know, and so I I'm very cautious of when I want to plant, or even uh, everybody's talking about frost seeding right now. I wait till the end of March, you mm -hmm. know, because it's it's a safe bet. Yeah, you know, I go putting it in now. It's going to be wet. The seed's going to be soggy for months. You know. Mm -hmm. and we got a lot of cold weather yet so i'm not so worried about that <clears throat> yeah i have uh i'm heading up to the farm i think may 12th because i'm just i don't have any weekends or nothing free right now um but i go may 12th i'm gonna frost seed um so i'm waiting until then i could do it i could make a trip there but you know a lot of guys are jumping on that because it's warm right now we're getting these warm yeah. temperatures but it's just there's no need it's too early right now you're saying May, all the way out in May, March, April, May? March. Okay, March 12th. March 12th. Got you. You said May. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so it be March 12th. Yeah, got yeah, you. Yeah, so I'm going to be frost seeding then. Um, but back on to the uh, herbicide-free food plots is I'm going to try to do the second planting. If not, I would time it to where I have that one planting leading into the fall. And then... All I'm going to do is disc that back in, disc that buckwheat back in, and I want to plant things such as brassicas or really the ultimate thing to do, depending your situation, would be a cereal grain such as winter wheat. The plant in there, you can even do some clovers. That way, it's going to outgrow the weeds in the fall. Most time, the weeds are you know, going dormant that time anyway. So you're not going to get much weed growth, you know, in the fall planting. That's going to go all winter long. And then that wheat is going to be the very first thing that greens up in the spring way before your weeds. So you're going to have that, that uh, cereal grain growing before your weeds. And then when spring green up actually hits, you're not going to have many weeds in your plot. Right. So you, you know, herbicide, you know, they're not 100% needed. There's, I think they're overused a lot of times. And, you know, the people that get on, get on people about disc in the ground, well, what are the chemicals doing to the ground? Yeah. You know, no, nobody knows there's, there's theories and this and this and this, but, you know, give and take on everything, you know, they're needed sometimes. And then sometimes you can, you don't need them. Well, the discing thing and killing worms and everything. Yeah. You know, how many, how many do you miss when you disc? <laughs> you, you know, you're going through like that. How many are you missing in between the discs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, yep. they claim you're killing them all. You know, you're not killing them well, all. I, no, I always got I, worms in my plots and I disc. 
Oh my gosh. I, I went out and pulled, I pulled some plants last year, just reached down and grabbed a, a purple top or something and pulled up one and the roots are hanging off of it and just worms, worms. all. Yeah. It's just full of worms crusted all around it. Yep. You know, I am not worried about killing worms, you yeah. know? Yeah. I'm really there's, not. There's plenty of them there. I mean, you're talking a quarter, half acre, one acre to it, whatever it is, you're not going to kill all the worms. No, no. And, and actually just to change a gear here, um, for first time guy like when i took the piece across the road and turned it from a horse pasture into a plot a first time piece of property or virgin property or something you may have to spray that the very first time to get a get control of it mm -hmm. um but still would recommend probably uh of course mowing as short as you can and and uh ripping it up and letting letting it sit for a little while and allow that regen to start coming back and then spray it, mm -hmm. you know, um, in case anybody's a first time or needed to know that Yeah, it is, it is beneficial to spray on a virgin piece. Um, but after that you should, should be able to control it. If not, okay. A little herbicide here and there won't, won't break the bank, but yeah, it can be done without using All the it, the cancer causing caustic chemicals. Yeah, it can definitely be done. I've, I've done it many times. Um, I always say too, if you're planting annuals, you can get away with not using chemical. If you're planting perennials, then there's times where you have to use um, chemicals and there's a balance on both sides too. Some, some plots you in reason dave is saying that is because perennials grow so slowly and annuals will grow much quicker yeah definitely yep and then uh you know again there's a balance on both sides some guys some you know areas some soil just has different seeds dormant seeds in there that could really screw you up mm -hmm. so there's times where you you have to use chemicals like down in your plot at the at your house down at the bottom you have a problem with what that's chickweed down yeah. there. Yeah. Chickweed yeah. and it's it will take over if you don't do something about it. Mm -hmm. So I do I do hit that annually once to control that. Mm -hmm. And uh over over the destination plots though it's not so bad. I get a I get a, a smart weed. It's the, it's the one with the little pink mm -hmm. balls on it. Yep. It's kind of that, stays low to the ground. Yeah. Yep. That one, that one. So you're telling me smart weeds outsmarting you. No, if you let it go, the birds will take care of those little seeds. Yeah. But the chickweed you can't control that. It has thousands and thousands per per yeah. plant at the get and, it before it seeds yeah and if you walk through it after it goes to seed they literally are just jumping off the plant looks like fleas mm -hmm. you know flying or something you know yep. they're the, they're the, they're the tiny little mustard seed looking things that mm -hmm. are all over your socks or something yep. you know when you walk through them but they literally jump all over the place but yeah i mean it i know we're talking about herbicide free but Man, there's sometimes you just need it. Yeah, there's definitely sometimes. Um, if people focus on planting the right things, they can get away with not using it. If you if you don't want to use herbicides, focus on cereal grains and annuals. You know, and if you have to get into the perennial side where you're growing such as uh, things like chicory or clovers, alfalfa, alpha, sometimes you have to get into that chemical use and a great product that um we've been using is uh, imox yeah. imox will control all them weeds in that clover plot yeah i'm really liking the imox yeah definitely if anybody's considering imox for your clover plot it's seven eight ounces uh per acre mix in roughly 20 25 gallons of water and uh, hit those weeds early and then wait a couple weeks and mow it and you'll be good to go 
Yeah, and it's it's not gonna it's not gonna kill or injure your clovers or alfalfas. And no. I think I think if your chicory is established enough, it, it shouldn't touch the chicory. No, nah, so, I ain't gonna mess with it. So you're you're looking pretty good in the springtime, spring and summertime if you're using that. Mm-hmm. As long as you don't have a blend in there or something silly, I, it'll probably kill your buckwheat. Oh yeah, easy. Yeah, yeah. kill your buckwheat, kill it'll your. Burn kill your uh, wheat and rye and all that stuff too so yeah, it, it would burn that stuff out so you don't you don't want to have that big of a blend going but if you're talking clover alfalfa chicory you're safe mm-hmm. oh you're safe yeah and that's what i'm doing this year i mean i've i've established stuff last year and this year i'm going to frost seed and then uh the first couple weeks i start to see any weed if any which i think i probably will um i'll probably hit it with with the eye mocks you know, but I don't know. I don't know if the IMOX is proven safer than Glide. That's a whole nother, whole nother thing to talk about later on another podcast, maybe. But yeah, the potency of something like that, you know, getting on your skin health risks and whatnot. Well, I, you know, the, the t- if you watch TV and listen to all that stuff, they'll tell you that it's not, or the government it tells you it's safe. But I just, yeah. I, I, why, why risk something else? You know, everything freaking right. causes cancer. So why, why risk getting it on your skin when you? Oh, definitely, definitely. You know what I mean? Definitely wear long sleeves and safety right, glasses or, and gloves and yeah, breathing it in or whatever. Why add? Yeah. Why add to it? You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I, I wear dust masks and everything when I do yeah. that. Yeah. But like you said, the the uh, the wife checks up on stuff she calls companies and asks them if they've used gly or any chemicals on their foods and things. She, she researches back into that because my boy's condition with Crohn's disease, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of these companies, they, they will tell you straight up. Yeah. That's there's, there's been some chemicals used here, you know, yeah. and, but they'll say, Oh, but the FDA approves it, you know? Well, yeah, yeah they may approve it because somebody's laundering that money, but right. <laughs> yeah, they I mean, tell you, they tell you it's yeah. safe and the consumptions that you're doing, you know, but guys and everything. I mean, you're, it's hard to get away of, uh, away from it. But again, if you're physically using it, why be by, why be lazy with it? Like cover up, you know what I mean? Protect right. yourself a little bit right. with using it. Um, that's just my opinion. Yep. For sure. For sure. So I think you, uh, I think you wanted to jump in and, talk a little yeah. bit about fertilizer and yeah good how, time. yeah and, and how your ph directly uh reflects that yeah i've, I've been watching and, and everybody knows it watches my channel i get i get a lot of content for things by reading these forums on facebook and right now there's a lot of people talking about uh lime liquid lime um I, I need to get a soil test. How do I do it? This, that, and the other. But what I, what I, essentially what I saw repetitiously was people talking about their, their pH after they did get a soil sample was like in the high fours, low fives, Ooh. Ooh. you know, and how much, how much lime do I put on now? Can I, can I do split applications and things? And of course, yes, you can do that. But what I wanted to get into was, if you do not amend according to those sample recommendations, when your pH is so low like that, and you at the cost of things right now, you're you're going to be really throwing away money on your fertilization because when your pH is that low and you add fertilizer, studies have been done. Like if your pH is at like a 5.5 or lower, they say that 50% of the fertilizer that you add to your ground is unusable. So if you're spending 500 bucks on bags of fertilizer, 250 of it is wasted. It's just not available to the plant because your pH is so low and it will not allow – that stuff is bound in the dirt and it doesn't allow it to be uptaked into the plant. So, I would add I would add to that real quick too is not only is you know 50 percent unusable because of the soil's acidic if you have a low CEC number in your soil that fertilizer just runs right through it as well so not only are you the soil can't use 50 percent of it you're losing 
a portion of it because you have poor soil because the CEC is low. It can't be used. Yep. Yep. And it, and it, and you have problems with it leaching away if you don't have organic matter holding it. Correct. So yeah, you're, you're talking a lot of waste and, you know, as your pH number climbs, the amount of fertilizer being able to be processed through the plant climbs also. Mm -hmm. So when you get to like, they say optimum is around a six, five, what a six, five, you're still at like 90% on your fertilizer, meaning 10% is unusable. Mm -hmm. So even though you're proud and have a 6.5 pH, you're still losing some money on fertilizer. Yeah. So the highest you can get it, you know, is the best optimal situation is what it was, what we're trying to do here is save you money and tell you guys and educate, you know, it's not that we're trying to throw no knowledge out at you. It's just that, you know, this is important stuff to know with the cost of things nowadays. If we can help you and save you some money, I mean, this knowledge is power here. Well, not and, only are you going to save money, you're going to have a, you're going to have a better crop. Why, well, why, sure. why plant something in acidic soil? Yeah. Like, I mean, they, people skip that step and in that situation, you're better off just not even adding fertilizer, just spend your money on lime. Just lime it. Yep. Just get your pH up where it needs mm -hmm. to be. And that was another thing I seen on there this weekend too was uh what'd you see? I seen the people that admittedly want to skip their soil sample but wanted to know what would a generic amount per acre be mm -hmm. to add yeah. fertilization to how much right. how many pounds of lime and how much fertilizer should i use and everybody was on there like screaming and caps cap locks were on you know get the soil sample you know now the soil sample costs you less than 20 bucks and a bag of fertilizer is like 25 right now why would you skip it mm -hmm. i don't i don't understand it i don't understand it either it's always been that way um i I hammer on it on videos, you hammer on it in videos, and um, I'll still get that message over the summer. Hey, Dave, I planted a food plot. It didn't, something happened with it. It turned purple. It didn't grow right. What's going on? And my first response is, what's your pH? What's your soil sample say? And don't yeah. say, oh, well, I didn't get one. And I'll say, well, I can't help you. Yeah, it's hard to help somebody when they don't know. It's all a guess. Yes. It's all a guess without it. Yep. And I, I tried that, you know, early on when I started plotting and stuff, you know, I, I tried to do that guessing game and it, it doesn't work out very good for you. Mm -hmm. You know, it just does not. I mean, yeah, every, uh, you could get lucky, but. Well, I mean, last year, I think when I bought fertilizer, I bought some triple 19, it was like $39 a bag, $39. And on average, you're going to, going to be adding anywhere from two to 400 pounds of fertilizer per acre. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, and, and if you get a soil sample, you know, I'd always make a joke about it. If you get a soil sample, it's either going to cause you to spend more money because you need fertilizer or it's going to end up saving you money because you might not need any. Yeah. Instead of just going out and saying, Hey, what's on like, in general, what I throw on my, on my soil and some, I, and if you read the back of a bag, there's, they're just general terms. It'll they tell say, you like 300 pounds. Yeah. Right? And you may not need 300 what pounds. If you don't, yeah. What if you don't need 300 pounds now? Now you've added all that fertilizer in that you didn't need and it's full of salt and fillers, which is essentially lowering your pH. Correct. So if you're, if you're throwing and that's another thing we could talk about too. I mean, if you're putting that much fertilizer on, if you have that big a recommendation, don't forget that all those fillers lower your pH. So you should be adding a couple bags of pelletized lime with your fertilization program yeah. upon upon putting all that in your dirt. To offset it. To yeah. offset it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Synth synthetic fertilizer will lower the pH. Um, I have noticed in triple 10 triple 13 there is lime in those bags sometimes depending on who you buy it from yeah yep. 
but I have never seen it in triple 19. Hmm. I've never seen Lime in, in triple 19. Yeah. So there was triple 10, triple 13s, um, does have some lime mixed in it because like there's salt in there and it lowers the pH. Plus it's, it's better filler than salt. Yeah. And they know that you need to offset it anyhow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess someone was smart and incorporated that in. Yeah. It's, it's probably cheaper to mix a bag with lime in it than to mix it with salt. Anyhow, probably. Did you ever price? Yeah. Back in the day when you was putting, stuff out in your soil for minerals and things and you bought you bought the uh the dye calcium phosphate and the the rock salt and all that you mix that all together and threw it in the dirt for the deer to eat mm -hmm. yeah those those bags of salt were probably there well i know they were more than a bag of lime yeah so it, it's cheaper for them to actually mix with lime definitely for, yeah. for a filler if you think mm -hmm. about it on their on their side you know right let's uh let's take a dive real quick into liquid lime mm. um there's a lot of companies that sell it and personally i don't recommend it um i think it could be used in conjunction with pelletized lime or or ag lime or something but to solely rely on um liquid lime i think is a is a waste of time and money I I don't have any experience with it, mm -hmm. and the more I read about it, um, I'm I'm finding that it doesn't even have some of them don't even have calcium carbonate in it, mm -hmm. and calcium carbonate is what you need to raise your pH. So yeah. I I don't I don't know why you would want to spray well, something like that out there if it didn't have the carbonate in it. It's a quick fix, you know. It's a it's a band aid. It's is a what very it is. Temp very temporary fix. Yeah. From, from what I understand. Um, I've seen guys where they have tested before and after, and it did change the pH, but it only lasted for about two weeks. Uh -huh. And in that time frame, I guess it allows your plants to get started. But then I've seen it where I have some I had some guys using it. And then they had good plots starting out. And then as time went on, those plots faded out. It's because the liquid lime wore off. The pH goes back to acidic. Right. And then it can't transfer the nutrients to the plants. And then your plants die. Yeah. So what do you do? You spray this stuff out, get a start. And mm -hmm. then what are they going to do? Go back and top dress with bags of lime? Right. I mean, if even if they do, it takes two, three, four months for that to sink in mm -hmm. to be usable. Yeah, you know, to make a difference, so they're not helping themselves really. It, it's it sounds like a big waste. It I is. Mean, it's some of them are expensive, uh, but it's just a band aid. You know, I think if you used it with lime, so if you put your pelletized lime out, you maybe rolled that in or you work that into the dirt a little bit. You you spread your liquid lime and then you seed. I think that is okay because you're going to get the instant. Uh, pH change to allow the plants to germinate while your um, pelletized lime and, and everything is is going to provide you with long term benefits because you know I'll see guys that are that are using liquid lime and say hey I'm putting out liquid lime I'm I'm fixing the soil and I'm feeding the deer the highest nutrients level no dude you're lying to yourself because the ph is going to go right back to where it was before you sprayed the liquid lime right. and then your plants aren't going to deliver the maximum nutrients to the animals because your ph is freaking acidic yeah it's just it's just marketing you know it's just it's just a gimmick now if there's one out there that actually is calcium carbonate that would be cool to know i mean if if you could find one that actually is the real deal i that think would, the, that would be handy to have i've seen some on the ag side of liquid right. lime they're yeah. probably your top ones they're i've expensive. seen some of that but you gotta buy it in like a five gallon bucket or a 55 right. gallon drum and yeah. it is costly it is the the deer side the food plot marketing side of that's it's I, just it's a i don't know of a legit one Maybe somebody out there does, but I don't know a legit one yeah. on the deer side. Yeah, people will say, uh, like, um, 
deer grow or plot start and boost and all this other stuff come on man like it's just it's a it's uh i don't want to i don't want to say bad stuff but you're gonna get me in trouble (laughs) well instead of getting in trouble let's talk about uh the people that want to plant trees for plots instead of planting Mm. like food plots people are interested in like chestnuts now or oaks you know all these different oaks and things and they're starting them out Mm -hmm. now um as far as soft mast or acorns and nuts go Mm -hmm. i think you and i agree that those those things are nice to have Mm -hmm. but when the fruit drops and the animals clean them up what do you got left you're left with none left with nothing you want my opinion go for it you're up all right all right so i think fruit trees is a powerful attractant to deer i killed my biggest buck of my life that passed an apple tree just to go to a pear tree or a uh, persimmon tree Mm. so i think adding those in can be beneficial as long as you're not solely relying on those Mm. you need food plots food plots provide the wildlife with more days weeks months of food compared to fruit trees now people make the argument oh well i can get different varieties of apples to where some drop in September, some drop in October, some drop in November, but still when they're gone, they're gone. Not only that, when they're dropping, you have raccoons eating them, birds eating. So you're losing some of the food, but I think in conjunction with a actual food plot program, they can be beneficial, but then people are putting them in lazy. They're not staking them. They're not tubing them. They're not fencing them off. The deer rake them. I've seen a lot of failures with them because of that reason. Um, so, I, again, I think there can be a balance. They can, but I, I what you're talking about is I, I've seen the guys where they don't want to plant food plots for whatever reason, and they're just solely relying on fruit. And the fruit drops, the deer eat it, it's gone, and then they lose all their deer. Yeah. So I think that guys, where their season comes in early in archery, like in September, where I don't have that ability because everything comes in here early October, Mm -hmm. a majority of those fruit have dropped or matured. Um, they're either rotting on the tree or they've dropped in critters or cleaning them up as soon as they drop. And there again, like we said, they're, they're gone. Um, nuts, some of them seem to hang on, you know, partway through October or whatever, but the squirrels are carrying them away, you know, hiding them, uh, (laughs) <laughs> when they're gone they're I, gone like we're I saying know. you know yeah i mean but I, I could see it being beneficial to the guys with an early season okay yeah. now yeah. in my region not gonna happen yeah. like you you did bring up a good point though um i just saw somewhere where a guy talked about a crab apple tree that hung on mm-hmm. until like december or something like that Maybe that would be beneficial, but for the guys, they're talking about nuts, planting oak trees or whatever. Do you know how long it takes for an oak tree to produce a nut? I mean, mm-hmm. come on. They grow as much underground as they do above ground. For every foot above ground, they have that much below ground that had to grow first. You know, I've yeah. got a tree out here in the yard when I built this house. Uh, it was like two foot tall. I've been here 20 years and the thing's still only like 15 feet tall, not a nut yet. Yeah. After, nah, after 20 years. Yeah. It's, uh, I guess you can plant them for your, the next generation. Well, yeah. For your, if you for sure, your property yeah. and all that, but for you could. most, most hunters want instant gratification. Exactly. And, and planting a fruit and nut tree is not instant gratification. That was my whole point behind this discussion. Now, 
there is some out there we were like you and I were discussing earlier, like some of those Dunstan chestnuts or whatever they say they can drop in three to five years or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, but there again, late September, early October gone. Yeah. They're, they're a good addition to a food plot and yes. habitat program. Yeah. But, I mean, there, there's a whole plethora yeah. of things you could do to help yeah. yourself between browse plots, trees, mm -hmm. you know, mast. I mean, that's what you want. You want a whole habitat. Yeah, but not to solely rely on just one thing. And sure. you have a long-term benefit, such as trees and things. And then you have that instant gratification for as far as food plot goes. And if I had to pick one or the other, I'm going to pick food plots. I would pick a plot, yeah, for sure. You know? For sure, because that's not only that, but it's operator errors a little easier with it, too, I would say. Well, yeah, and then the fruit trees, you, they got to be pruned. Are you going to prune them to actually get the maximum benefit? Are you going to stake them? Are you going to tube them? Are you going to fence them off? How about you know, last year when it froze off everything? We didn't get any acorns. Right. So, then you got you got a whole area of trees with nothing on it for the deer. Right. Where, where's that guy going to hunt? Yeah. He's going to have to learn how to hunt. Mm hmm You know, yeah. not not be hunting over over a tree. And, you know, side note. And we're done after this. Let me just wrap it up with this. Oh, we're done. Yeah, we're done. Let me let me wrap it up with this quick story. You're making you're making a wrap. I'm wrapping it. All right, wrap so, it to the wrap it to the audience. So we had a buck pool every year when I was in apprenticeship school for the union that I was in, and this one guy, he won every year except last year. I ended up winning, but anyhow. He ended up admitting to me how he won. He had a he had a apple tree in mom and dad's backyard and put a tree stand in the apple tree. And he was he was shooting the deer as they was coming in for the apples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's how he won his buck pool. Yeah. Well, I will say this. <laughs> if you want to shoot monster bucks, plant persimmon trees. Deer love persimmons. I have never I don't even know what they look like. They're they're about that big, right? And they kind of got like an orangish tint to them. They're real. They're soft. When you eat them, if you don't eat them when they're perfectly ripe, it leaves your tongue feeling like sandpaper. Oh. Now, next to my parents' house, there was a there's a property there. It's all county owned now. The the landowner, Mister Bickle, where I shot this buck at, um, he passed away, but he had one persimmon tree. And he would, and he lived to like 104 years old and he was always at that persimmon tree picking persimmons and eating them. And I was a young kid, six, seven years old and he'd, he'd feed them to me and it would leave, it would give me like a sandpaper feel, but those deer would walk past perfectly ripe apples yeah. to go right to that persimmon tree. Yeah. I, I don't have any, I don't have any knowledge of those. I don't have any around. Yeah, I do have an apple tree and a pear tree, and like you said, they will step over apples to get to the pears. Yeah, for so, sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, we're in park, guys. Um. Oh, real quick, I wanted to say that somebody left a comment on the Apple Spotify or Apple iTunes app, oh. and said he loves the podcast. And the funniest part is when we crack jokes. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. He said, I, he, he's like, when you and Chris get on each other or crack like little <laughs> smart jokes is the best part of the podcast. I don't know why, but everybody loves that. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right. We're in part, guys. Uh, thanks for listening and uh, appreciate the support video on Chris's channel. And um, man, well, I guess we'll see you guys on number 10. Yeah, start subscribing and get over and watch and get over and listen. Yeah. See you guys.